sub example four. And this is going to be related to chapter six. So here's I'll get a little bit of chapter six in here. Maybe I will also assign a problem or two from chapter six. We'll see what I can find. Let S be the sum of U1 and U2. Hmm. Add the random variables. In problem sets, we did that. We added random variables before. You might even remember we can find the moment generating functions when they're independent pretty easily. Remember that when you add two independent random variables, you, you multiply their moment generating functions. Remember that from problem stats, chapter seven. So we can find the moment generating function for U1 and U2 pretty simply. Or let, me, let me go ahead and find it here. X1 and X2 are independent, and Y is their sum. Then the moment generating function of Y is the product of the moment generating functions for X1 and X2. So we could have we could approach it that way. And I'm not going to, because actually, if I do, we'll see a moment generating function that will not match the table in chapter four. So we won't be able to use the fingerprint theorem because of that. Identifies random variables by their NGFs. Let's do use a different approach to try to describe the distribution of S. Let's find its CDF. Capital F sub capital S of little s is the probability that capital S, maybe for the capital S, I should put, do that. I, I won't bother except right there, but. That's the probability that U1 plus U2 is less than or equal to little less. Hmm. Are trying the same technique as before? I like need to isolate U1 or on one side. But then I have a U2 on the other side. And if I had tried isolating U2, then I'd have a U1. Not, not so clear what to do here. And in fact, adding random variables and finding their PDFs in general is a very difficult thing. And the abstract case, at least with the assumption of independence, you end up computing the PDF is something called a convolution. Maybe you've heard of that word. Probably you haven't. Physics majors hear of it. Um, we will talk about convolution in here in the discrete case next week sometime, maybe Tuesday. Probably Tuesday, we will. In the discrete case, it's easy to think about convolution. In the continuous case, it's hard. However, we still can figure this out. So what we can do is we can think about the joint density of U1 and U2. Um, the joint density of the bivariate random variable u1 comma u2 as a point or a vector by independence that joint density would be the product of the joint densities of U1 and U2, of the, the densities of U1 and U2 individually. Now those densities are the same because U1 and U2 are both uniform zero one. 
So they both equal one when they are in the domain where they are positive and they're zero or elsewhere. One times one is one. Anything times zero is zero. This is going to be as a multivariable calculus function, a piecewise function where its output is one if both U1 and U2 are between zero and one. I could write that like this and zero otherwise. It's graph in three dimensional space It's going to be a horizontal plane above the square where u1 and u2 are between negative both between negative one and one. There's the graph right there above the u1 u2 plane. The bigger plane is like that, and the square where u1 and u2 are both between zero and one is like this, and the graph up is has a value of one up there. The the volume underneath that graph is one. It's a cube. It is a PDF, that's what I'm trying to say. And this probability can be thought about using this PDF. And effectively, the prob because the, the height of this graph is one, the volume, numerically speaking, under the graph is the same as the area above the square or the area of the square and that holds for sub squares of the bigger square as well or sub regions of the of the square so what i'm trying to say here is what you want to do is you want to think about the u1 u2 plane you want to think about the unit square in that plane and to think about these probabilities you want to interpret this inequality graphically. Maybe I actually should use capital use here. That's it's a little weird, but it might make, might make more sense. U1 plus U2 being less than or equal to S, where S is an arbitrary number between zero, oh, here's something new, between zero and two, not zero and one. Right, because if U1 and U2 are both really, really close to one, then their sum is really, really close to two, and I can make it arbitrarily close to two by making U1 and U2 sufficiently close to one. The equation U capital U1 plus capital U2 equals S can be rewritten as capital U2 equals S minus capital U1. And for a fixed value of S, graphically in this picture that its graph would be a straight line with a slope of negative one and a vertical intercept of s in other words if s is say right there the graph of this equation looks like this a line with a slope of negative one and a vertical intercept of s when s is between in the case where s is between zero and one in the case where s is between one and two it's the same equation, but now the graph looks like this, and I'm only going to boldface the one that's in the rectangle, the square here. That's what the graph of this equation looks like when S is between one and two. And this probability is the probability that the sum is less than or equal to S, not equal to S. Graphically, that corresponds to the volume under the joint density above a given region, like above this triangle, for example, when S is between zero and one. But again, because the height of this graph is one, the volume under the graph is the same as the area of the region, the area of the triangle in this case. This area is the value of capital F sub S of little s when S is between zero and one, little s is between zero and one. And it's a, it's a triangle, so its area is base times, one and a half base times height is one half s squared.
when s is between one and two, then we think about the area that's still in this uh, square that's under this other graph. But I got to stay in the square still. So it's the area of not a triangle anymore, a region like this that I could break up into a rectangle, another rectangle, and a triangle. But it's probably easiest to think of it as the area of the entire square minus or subtracted from one. Or, yeah, one minus, I meant to say one minus the area of this triangle. Calculate this as one minus that area. Uh, it's a little tricky. You got to figure out what the coordinates of these points are. When u1 is one, what's u2? Plug into that formula, you get s minus one. The coordinates of this point are one comma s minus one. That's the point right there. And the coordinates of this point by symmetry are s minus one comma one. And this distance then right here is the second coordinate of this point is one, one minus the second coordinate of that point, which simplifies to um, two minus S. Yep, that's right. In the case where S is between one and two, that distance is two minus S. I mean, think about it when S is one and the line looks like this, two minus one is going to be one and the length is one. When S goes up to two, when the line's going to look like this. Two minus two is zero. The, the distance is going to be zero. That's confusing. Just think about it carefully after class. So what I'm trying to say here is this ultimately is also an area that's shaded purple. And that area is one minus the area of that triangle. And the area of that triangle is that. Simplify. And you're left with negative one half s squared plus two s minus one if I've not made a mistake. And this, if you factor out a negative one half, I believe might be factorable, maybe. Uh, Um, maybe not so nice today. Did I do that right? I was thinking that might be a perfect square, but it's not. I don't know if I maybe made a mistake here. Anybody see any, any mistakes? Um, I mean, the mistake could be up here, actually. Looks all right. I don't see a mistake. Right up there? Is that what you mean? I'm subtracting the second coordinates. The second coordinate to this point is 1. The second coordinate to this point is s minus 1. 1 minus s minus 1 simplifies to 2 minus s. S is between one and two, so this is a this is a number between zero and one. I don't see any mistakes. Um, if I graph this CDF, this proposed CDF, it's a piecewise function ultimately. Do the pieces match up at S equals one? Between zero and one, the formula is one half s squared, whose graph will look like this, and have a value of one half when s is one. Does this have a value of one half when s is one? It does, actually. Plug in one there, you get negative one half 
plus two minus one, two minus one is one. One minus one half is one half. And this graph is an upside down parabola, negative coefficient there. Is its value at two equal to one? Let's check that. Negative, uh, plug in S equals two. Two squared is four times negative one half is negative two. Plus four is positive two minus one is one. Yeah, it, it, it is correct. It's a continuous function that looks like this. And this, this, the PDF would be a piecewise function as well. Differentiate this piecewise, you're going to get, in the first case, the derivative of one half s squared is going to be s. And the derivative of this thing is going to be ultimately negative s plus two. And the graph of the PDF, if you graph this piecewise function, is a triangle. That's the graph of the PDF. Hey, how do I really relate this to chapter six? This is my last comment. I added these two random variables there. If I just divided them by two, that would be taking their mean. I could call it X bar, sample mean. I didn't divide by two, I, I could have. This is almost the distribution of the sample mean when the sample size is two. If I divided by two up there, what would happen is the, this would change for f to be s between zero and one. Because if I divide a number between zero and two by two, the result is between zero and one. The graph would look the same, except this would be a half, this would be one. The height would be different but it still would be a triangular distribution, which is closer to looking like a normal distribution than a uniform one is. I won't finish it, it in class because we're out of time, but you could simulate this. You could go back to the spreadsheet, make one more column for the sum of u1 and u2 equals d1 plus e1. Oops, forgot my plus sign. Equals d1 plus e1. And sometimes you get numbers bigger than one here. In fact, over half, about half the time you do. And the mean should be close to one. It's, it's symmetric. symmetric. It's a triangular distribution, which is closer to a normal, which is hinting at the central limit theorem. As n gets larger and larger. All right, have a good day.